Hi, I'm Mitch, and this is the second video in a two-part series on the differences between part design and part workbenches. In this video, I simply follow this example on the FreeCAD website. In this page, dedicated specifically to this topic. If you really want to understand this topic well, I suggest that you follow along uh, from this site during the video, then go read this entire page, then go back to using only part design workbench until you have it mastered. Okay, so we're in FreeCAD. We're going to do the part design version of this first, so we'll create new. We'll come up here to start and we'll go down to the part design workbench and then we'll uh, start Sketcher from <clears throat> there and we'll make our first sketch in the XZ plane and now all I need to do is uh, draw this initial shape here you can see all the dimensions so I'm just gonna follow this quickly and I'll fast forward through most of it I think I'm going to slow this down for just a second because I realize I've got my preferences set for inches and I want that millimeters. So we're going to go edit preferences and then I'm going to go over to the far right to units and then I'm going to choose metric small parts units so we get back to millimeters. And then we can fast forward again through this. So I'm going to slow this down one more time because I don't think I've shown how to use this particular feature before. I've got this thing fully constrained, but I still need these two fillets, the one in the top right corner that says R3 millimeters, and then the bottom inside corner. And I'm going to assume that one's also supposed to be 3 millimeters. To do that, I'm going to use a constraint preserving fillet. The reason for that is that we have these sharp corners that our constraints are based off of, and when I put the fillet on, I'm going to lose that, but I want to maintain that constraint. So I'm going to use a constraint preserving fillet for both of these corners. And I'm going to constrain each of those to 3 millimeters. Okay, so I've got that fully constrained, so we can close this and go back to our model. That's our sketch. And now I want to, you can see that, um, and now step two is to revolve this around the z-axis. So we will do a revolution. It automatically picks the axis. That looks right, so we'll just say okay. And now step three is to make this uh, kind of an octagon type of shape. And so we'll go back to a create a sketch, and this says to choose it in the XY plane. And there it is. And I'm going to fast forward through this as well. I just used the regular polygon tool to make a hexagon the same size as the outside diameter of the original revolution and using the link to external edge function. And then I made a concentric circle also with an outside diameter the same size as that original revolution. Okay, we've got that fully dimensioned. We can close this task. And then we can create a pocket and go through all. And reverse it. So, so it wanted to pocket it downwards, so I just reversed that dimension and that brought the pocket up. So we hit OK. And step five is to create this triangle here in the XZ plane. So again, we'll go to Sketcher, we'll pick that last plane, and we'll hit OK. Now 
Now I want to be able to see this at the cross section. So I'm in a view section. And now I can see the plane that I'm uh, drawing in reference to. And we're just going to draw this triangle. I'm going to fast forward through this as well. Uh, the only thing to know about this triangle is that I had to use link to external geometry again to constrain the base of the triangle to the upper face of the flange. Okay, so we're all constrained. We can close this. Step six is to pad that, and it doesn't tell me how much it wants it padded, so I'm just going to guess. We want to pad it symmetric to plane, and I think that looks like, I don't know, maybe a five millimeter pad. So now steps 7, 8, and 9 are to create a counterbore hole, then revolve both the counterbore and this rib around the z-axis. The part design side of the tutorial doesn't give me the hole dimensions, but the part side of the tutorial does, so I'll reference these dimensions. So I selected the flange face to sketch the hole on and then went to Sketcher. To center the hole in this segment, I used Link to External Geometry and selected the outside edge of the hexagon. Then I switched to construction geometry and drew a line from the origin out to that external geometry and constrained it to be perpendicular to that edge. Then I constrained the center point of the circle to that construction geometry and then added the rest of the dimensions that were called out in the tutorial. That's fully constrained. And then that's just a hole. And it doesn't really tell us, but we do need to make the bigger hole here as well. So I'll select this plane again, and we'll make the bigger hole. Make another sketch. Make a concentric hole there. And the radius of this looks like it's supposed to be 9 millimeters. Goodness. Yeah. OK. All right, so we've got that selected. And we will make a pocket, not a hole. And we will make that, looks like, about 8 millimeters deep. OK. Looks a lot like that. And now we were, are on our last step. We are going to make a polar pattern of this hole and this pad. So we'll select all of those. Select polar pattern. And I want three occurrences. And there it is. In the second half of this video, we're going to do the same thing in the part workbench. I suggest you pause the video and refill your coffee. OK, so step one in the part workbench version starts out much like it did in part design. The primary difference is that we're going to start in the sketcher workbench. Uh, choose the sketch and then begin in the XZ plane. And notice that the plane selection dialog is a little bit different. Once in the XZ plane, uh, the sketch is identical, so I'm just going to skip to the end. That's fully constrained, and now if I close it, I'm still in the sketcher workbench, so I have to come up here and go down to the part workbench. I want to revolve this around the z-axis, which is this icon here. It's almost like you're in a totally different CAD package. All the functionalities are the same, uh, but the icons look a little bit different. I do want to revolve that around the z-axis, and it's already selected, so I'll hit OK. 
So now step three is to create this hexagon and circle sketch. So now we go back to Sketcher. And we'll select the XY plane. And this is also going to be identical to the previous method. So I'll just skip to the end again. And that's done. So I'll close. Again, we have to manually return to the part workbench. And where part design would call this a pad command, part calls it an extrude command. So we'll choose extrude. I want to extrude along the normal axis of the sketch, and then I want to extrude it 12 millimeters. OK. And there's our pad. So now we're going to use this Boolean toolbar that I mentioned in a previous video. Remember that part design workbench is a parametric modeling workbench. Part workbench uses the concept of constructive solid geometry. So my revolve, which I'll make uh, visible again, and my extrude features can be treated as primitive solids. And I'm going to use the Boolean cut command to cut the extrude from the revolve. Now it matters what order I select these in. Whatever I select first is the piece I'm going to keep. And whatever I select second is the piece that I'm going to cut. So I'll select the revolve first and I'll cut the extrude from that. So we've got them selected and I'll cut. Step five is a triangle so we go back to Sketcher Create sketch, sketch in the XZ plane, view section, and again the sketch process is identical to last time, so I'll skip to the end result. The sketch is fully confined, so I'll close, I'll go back to the part workbench manually again, it's already selected, so I'll extrude along normal I want five millimeters there and I want symmetric uh, the extrusion looks right so we'll hit OK now here's where things get weird notice that there's no polar pattern option in the part workbench and it's naughty to mix part and part design so I won't use the polar pattern option in part design Instead, I'll go to the draft workbench, which is now like yet another totally new CAD package. And this is called the draft modification toolbar here. And if I drop this menu down, I find a polar array. So I've got a, I'm going to choose my extrude. I'll come back to polar array. We do want to rotate it 360 degrees. We want three elements. And now you've got to be careful uh, because you can see that if I move my cursor into the workspace, notice how all the coordinates for the center of rotation change automatically with where my cursor is. And I don't want to rotate it around this center of rotation. I want to set, rotate it around the origin. So I've got to come back here and hit 0 and 0. And so that, that feature there is unique to the draft workbench. So let's keep my cursor in here. That all looks good. I'll hit OK. And there they are. Now, this looks like a single part, but it's actually two separate entities that happen to be touching. So we'll go back to the part workbench. and select the Union tool. And we have to select both of these pieces and Union. And now you can see that in the feature tree the cut and polar array have been combined in the fusion. So now we're going to repeat a few of these concepts to make this counterboard whole. Instead of drawing a circle on the face, I'm going to sketch the cross section. So I'll go back to the sketcher.
new sketch, and I'll sketch in the XZ plane view section, sketch half the cross section. Close, go back to part workbench, and revolve it. Now in this case, I can't just hit revolve because it has automatically selected the origin as the revolution axis. I don't want to revolve it around the origin. So first I'll go back to the feature tree, and I'll press the space bar. That toggles my fusion visibility off so I have a better view of my sketch. I'll go back to the Revolve task and come down to Select Reference. Now I'll select the outside edge of this sketch and hit Revolve. Now I'll go back to the Draft Workbench and repeat the Polar Array. And now we'll cut the array from the fusion. So we select fusion first. Oopsie. So we select the fusion first array. Bring back to our part workbench. And cut. I'm going to save this. And I'm going to open my previous parametric example. Because I want to compare the feature trees. So here in the parametric example, all of the operations were performed on the same single solid entity, which part design calls a body. The body must always be in one piece and operations are performed on that piece. Here in the FreeCAD CSG example, we can see the history of all the separate entities we created, which we then combine via Boolean operations in order to create the final step. We had to continuously create new separate bodies, which is expressly disallowed in the part design. To me, the constructive ge solid geometry style of modeling in part workbench is less intuitive than the parametric modeling of the part design workbench. There's also a lot more clicking manually between part and sketcher, and I don't love that I have to go to the draft workbench to find some of the tools I need. Now the FreeCAD help page where this example came from has a brief but excellent description of these concepts and the ramifications if you do need to mix the workbenches. I recommend reading that next. I hope that was helpful.